Well, hello there, everyone. Glad y'all had a good trip. My name is Cecil Brack. I'm the top game warden down here on Dino Hunt Corp's Earth Division. <laughs> Never heard of it? Well, I don't blame ya. We don't get too much recognition down here. Once interstellar travel became possible, folks jumped at the opportunity to take to the stars and visit alien planets. Lots of people live off-world in the colony spread across the galaxy now, and, of course, Hunting big game earth animals really lost a lot of its popularity by the end of the 20th century. But in the years since space travel became commonplace for the average person, earth has seen some big changes. Once dwindling animal populations have recovered nicely thanks to professional conservation efforts, genetic manipulation, and long breaks in official hunting seasons with most of the hunting efforts being redirected off-world now. Of course, you'd think with people leaving the planet this often, there'd be more room cleared up for the excess animals. But that wasn't the case. Management down here didn't quite know what they were doing, and the animals of Earth were facing brand new problems. However, because of their commendable conservation efforts on their dinosaur planet, Dino Hunt Corp was called in to set up an Earth Division and oversee all official hunting programs back here on the homeworld. Now, I've been working with this division for decades, and now I'm going to give y'all what you came here for. A little tour of our most popular destinations here on planet Earth. Now, I'm not exactly off duty today, I've still got a job to do. But it just so happened to work out that I can show y'all around and show off a little bit of what we do around here. Around this time each year, we tranquilize select animals from certain herds to check the health levels of the nearby animals and make sure diseases aren't spreading. And that's what we'll be doing today. So get your hiking boots on, get your cover scent sprayed, and let's head to our first destination, Colorado, USA. Colorado is a very special place to me. It's where I completed most of my endurance training for the job. It was named for the Colorado River, which means ruddy, and was inaugurated as the 38th U.S. state on August 1st, 1876. It also has a very diverse topography, or arrangement of physical features, by encompassing most of the southern Rocky Mountains, the northeastern portion of the Colorado Plateau, and the western edge of the Great Plains. It's a real lush environment, packed with a diverse mix of coniferous and deciduous trees and lots of different pine forests, let me tell you. The landscape changes dramatically depending on where you are, with a great mix of thick forests, open plains, and rigorous mountain ranges. Colorado is home to an abundance of wildlife for clients to observe, from the cardinals that chirp in the sky as they fly overhead, to the red foxes that hunt in the late autumn brush. But we're here for three specific animals today. Let's hop on up in our tree stand and see what we can find. Hmm. Looks like there's an elk back there in those trees. I wonder... Huh. What's that? Aha! A black bear. And a big one too. The American black bear is the most common bear species in the world. They're omnivores, basically meaning that they can eat both plants and meat. Typically, they live in large forests, but can be pushed out into the open in search of food. There are 16 different subspecies of black bear, mostly found in Canada, but widespread all across the North American continent, from Alaska to Mexico and definitely including Colorado. Here they function pretty much as dump trucks, 
They're not very big, a medium-sized bear, but they've got some respectable bulk and eat plenty of plants and animals to form a great balance with the other animals in their ecosystem. Let's see, we've got a bear right over this hill, but he's not wanting to come over here. This would be a great specimen to check for diseases, if we could just get him to show himself. Oh, here he comes. Gotta get ready. Here we go. Got him. There, that wasn't too bad, was it? I've had much worse bear encounters myself. Oh yeah, that's a handsome bear. And blood sample taken. Well, now that we've got the omnivore out of the way, I wonder which we'll find next. The herbivore or the carnivore? Oh, looks like it's going to be the herbivore. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the majestic Rocky Mountain Elk. The Rocky Mountain Elk is a subspecies of elk found, as you might have guessed, in the North American Rocky Mountain Range. With a wild population of around 1 million individuals, they spend their winters in open forests and their summers in alpine forests, and boy are they adaptable. But their history is a little bit tragic. These elk were almost hunted to extinction in the late 1800s but groups of elk were brought into the state in 1913 to help boost their numbers. Rocky Mountain elk in certain states, like Washington, are completely reintroduced specimens from Yellowstone National Park. In fact, Rocky Mountain elk have been used all across the United States to introduce source herds to establish a new eastern elk range. Unfortunately, despite their triumphant return, the Rocky Mountain Elk Herd was diagnosed with a serious disorder known as chronic wasting disease in 2010. And while the near two centuries since then have been good to the elk herd in containing the disease, it still hurts them. And that's what we're doing for this animal specifically, seeing just how widespread this disease is right now. Oh, there's a good-looking bull. Got him. These bigger animals have a much stronger resistance to our sedatives, so it takes a few more darts to get them fully sedated where it's safe for us to approach. But they'll be fine in a few hours. And let's see, oh yeah, this is a grand looking bull elk. And there we go, one more blood sample recovered. We'll get this sent off to the lab and hop back in the tree stand to scout out our last Colorado animal. Now let's see, I think I hear one off in the brush. They have excellent camouflage. Aha, there we go. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is a beautiful little bobcat. The bobcat is one of the most adaptable and widespread predators you can find here on North America, ranging all the way from Canada to Mexico and everywhere in between. It's actually pretty difficult to specify what bobcats eat because that's entirely dependent on where the bobcat lives. They can eat anything from insects to small rodents to birds and even deer if they can get a handle on them. Unlike many of its larger feline relatives, the bobcats never had an issue with declining numbers in the face of disease, habitat loss, or overhunting and that's mostly just thanks to how darn adaptable they are. 
Like I said, they can eat just about anything and live just about anywhere. And like most cats, they're pretty independent. So each bobcat is mostly focused solely on keeping themselves alive. Now let's see if we can't find ourselves a good looking specimen. Ah, there we go. He's a good ways out and in some thick brush though. Gonna have to make this shot count. There we go. Where? Oh, yeah. Now that's a good looking cat. And here we are. All right, blood sample acquired. And there we are, friends. With three animals observed and three blood samples taken, our Colorado tour is complete. Now let's get back to. Oh, hold on. If that's what I think it is. Uh oh. I'd recognize those spots anywhere, and you're not supposed to be here. This, everyone, is a fallow deer. Fallow deer are not native to North America. They're originally from Europe, but have been introduced pretty much all over the world from South America to Africa to Australia, and as you can see here, the United States. Their name comes from the pale brown color that covers most of their body, although fallow deer can commonly appear in a variety of coat colors, including dark brown, almost black, and even bright white. Although they have the same general build as other deer, fallow deer are pretty recognizable thanks to their large, palmated antlers and spotted coat, which they keep from the time they're a fawn all the way into adulthood. The United States actually has about five primary fallow deer herds that have been introduced, but the closest one to here is much farther south, not near this far into the Rockies. I've radioed headquarters and they're sending a relocation team, but asked if we could go ahead and tranquilize this buck for when the team arrives. So let's get to it, y'all. Now fallow deer, like most deer, are quite skittish, so we'll need to be extra cautious. We don't want to spook him further into the Rockies. Oh, there he is. Let's make this quick. Perfect. Nice and clean. We'll head on over and collect a blood sample for the research team and get a good look at this beautiful animal. There he is. Pretty magnificent, ain't he? And let's see here. Blood sample taken. Gorgeous deer, absolutely gorgeous. We'll keep an eye on him while we wait for the team. And there he goes. Good luck there, fella. Head on back to your family. Great work out there in the field today, y'all. I'll get all these blood samples off to the lab boys for a diagnostics run, and we'll be ready for our next adventure. South Africa is one of the most geographically unique hunting zones Dino Hunt Corp's Earth Division has to offer. As its name would imply, it is literally as far south in Africa as you can go, taking up the entire southern coast. Despite being so close to the ocean, most of South Africa is made up of a giant, nearly flat plateau, commonly known as the Central Plateau but there are still several places where rivers and mountains cut through the terrain. South Africa is mostly grassland, but is home to over 22,000 types of plants, including some tough ones like shrubs and acacia trees. 
near places with lots of fresh water, like the coastal plain of KwaZulu-Natal or around the Orange River, lush forests begin to emerge, and you can see a host of iconic African animals taking advantage of the abundance of life in these areas. Now, South Africa has an enormous roster of some of the most well-known animals on Earth, many of which would be happy to make a meal of us, but also some that are a bit less ferocious, but can be just as destructive for different reasons. Feral pigs are problem animals all over the world, from North America to Australia, and in more recent years, even here in the less predated areas of South Africa. They were introduced to aid in food shortages, and things didn't go well, so local officials are doing all they can to contain the problem before these pigs destroy the ecosystems. But these aren't the only wild pigs out on these plains, and if I follow these tracks correctly... Yup, there's our first one of the day, the Warthog. Warthogs are not normally found in South Africa specifically, but as part of Dino Hunt Corp's thorough reconstruction projects, several warthog families were introduced into Kruger National Park. And as a byproduct of their population explosion since then, many of the wild pigs have found their way out here. The common warthog is a pretty fierce subspecies, boasting an enormous head, a coarse mane running down the back of the males, and two pairs of ferocious looking tusks that are actually used in combat with other hogs or as self-defense weapons against predators. Now we just gotta make sure we keep our distance so they don't use them on us. Gotta stay hidden. There's one. Oh yeah, that's a good looking pig. Smaller animals use a lighter dosage, so we need to make this quick. Beautiful animal. <laughs> well, I think so anyway. And there we are, blood sample acquired. Now we've got one more South African animal to document, and I can hear it up behind this tree. Oh. Everyone stay perfectly still. There she is, everyone. The white rhinoceros. The white rhinoceros is an incredibly special animal. Not just here within our Earth division, but on our planet as a whole. Unlike many of the animals we'll see on our trip, the white rhinoceros has had many issues keeping its population stable over the years. By the year 2018, the northern white rhino's numbers had dropped into low single digits, and rhinos all over the world were fighting in the face of habitat loss and poaching. In fact, they still are. As is Dino Hunt Corp's regulation, when a game animal is killed on their property, be that up on the dinosaur planet, or now that they're running things down here, down on Earth, a hefty portion of the client's fees goes to support wildlife conservation for that division, and 100% of the taken animal is used for positive purposes across the galaxy, whether that's feeding the hungry or helping with scientific research. And while they are on Dino Hunt Corp's Earth hunting roster list, white rhinos are never killed during our tours. Hunters wishing to embark on a rhinoceros hunt actually take part in what we're doing right now, tracking, tranquilizing, and tagging the rhinos on our property to check on herd health, individuals, and general population numbers, allowing them to experience the thrill of a hunt and enjoy our wildlife while we get work done and help the animals return to glory. Now we don't have any rhino hunts booked this week, they're pretty pricey events, so we're gonna do this one ourselves. A 
A rhino's senses aren't great, so we can get pretty close. But we better stay low, just in case. There she goes. Okay, and she's down. We'll go get her blood sample taken while the research team is on the way. Such beautiful, tragic animals. There we go. Needed a hefty needle for that one. Oh, so long, hog. We'll watch over her until the field vets show up for our sample. Ah, looks like this rhino's name is Jahari, and it appears she's doing very well. Good to see you, old girl. Alright boys and girls, looks like that's gonna wrap up our South Africa trip. Y'all better bundle up. Appears we're heading up north for some cold weather and fierce predators. Alaska holds a very special place in my heart. Believe it or not, I was actually born here, though not in a place as wild as we're about to check out. Alaska is a gigantic state, a huge stretch of land purchased from Russia to become the 49th United States. And because it's so big, its geography and topography vary wildly depending on where you are. We're going to be spending our time in southwest Alaska, a region made mostly of marshes, rivers, and mountains. During the warmer months, the land here is extremely lush, providing lots of animals with plenty of food, from herbivorous caribou to omnivorous bears. This part of Alaska also has one of the richest concentrations of salmon in the world, and as such, attracts one of the most iconic salmon-eaten animals on planet Earth. And if we stick close to the water, we should be able to find a few. Hmm, I can hear something moving down in the brush, just beyond those trees. They're not the most outgoing animals in the world. I do hope we'll get a good look at them. Ah, there we go. The Mighty Grizzly Bear. Now, the name Grizzly Bear is actually a local name for what is known internationally as the North American Brown Bear. They were given this name by famed Earth explorers Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, who described them as looking grizzly. Of course, growing up here in Alaska, I called them grizzlies all the time. But when working with people from all the way across the galaxy, I had to get used to using a more proper name for the bears. Of course now, once Dino Hunt Corp got involved down here, and their marketing team thought grizzly bears sounded cooler, we made it the official name for our tour's purposes. Grizzlies are some of the largest carnivores on planet Earth. Like black bears, they're omnivorous and important to their ecosystems, but they do have some distinct differences that help tell them apart. Brown bears are, naturally, brown in coloration, although they can be found in a variety of colors. Brown bears also have a distinctive hump over their shoulders, and their rump sits lower than their shoulders, giving them a more rugged appearance. Now let's see if we can't find ourselves a bear. We're near water, so... Ah, there we go. Let's stay low. Gotta be careful. Got him. Oh, careful coming down the ledge here. Don't want anyone to break anything. Oh, yes, sir. What a mighty fine bruiser this is. 
field vets show up. For there we go. I'll get this sent off. What a magnificent animal. Now I'm hoping to find our next animal somewhere up in this... Oh, hold on a second. Is that? <laughs> well, it's not quite what I'd hoped for, but they are related. This, everyone, is the cunning red fox. The red fox is probably the most widespread predator on planet Earth. You can find one pretty much wherever you go in the Northern Hemisphere. From anywhere in the Arctic Circle to North Africa, North America, and Eurasia. Because they can be found all over the place, foxes have quite an extensive history with humans, and not all of it's good. These critters were once hunted for the fur trade, and were introduced to areas like Australia to kickstart the fox hunting sport down under. Foxes are also incredibly adaptive, and pretty much thrive alongside human expansion, living well in suburban areas, and some foxes are even being domesticated in Russia. These are excellent predators, and they'll eat pretty much anything, from rodents to birds, insects, reptiles, and even other fox species. Because they're so widespread and are doing so well, we usually don't keep too tight a watch on foxes. But with disease and ever-present danger during this part of the year, let's go ahead and check on Alaska's local fox population. Now, I believe I saw one up here through the brush. There we go. Perfect distance. Not too bad. Now, let's go make sure this fox is as healthy as he looks. Here we go. Such a beautiful animal. All right. Blood sample acquired. Now let's go see if we can't find the fox's larger relative. Now we should be able to hear our next animal before we see it. And I do believe that is our target. We've got to be extra cautious. Very territorial animals, these. Beautiful. Everyone, behold the majesty of the Grey Wolf. The wolf, which goes by Grey or Timber Wolf, is one of the largest canis species on our planet. Not near as large as the dire wolves up on the dinosaur planet, which are about to be featured in a new tour opening up there, but that's another story for another time. It's also one of the most specialized members of the Canis family, partly because of its specially adapted ability to hunt large prey and for how social and expressive it is. Wolves are commonly known as pack animals, where many members of a complex social group live together and work together to survive. They can communicate to each other through many different methods. Sometimes they use body posture, tail posture, or facial expressions to communicate. A wolf low to the ground is usually indicating submission, while a wolf with a tall body posture is usually assertive. Like most of our carnivore hunts on this planet, the targeted animal is usually a problem animal, or one that is ill beyond repair. Lots of wilderness up here gives wolves plenty of room to run around. But when they acquire a taste for human flesh, or come down with a potentially devastating disease, we alert our clientele that a hunting tour is now open. Luckily, this is not one of those cases. In fact, this is a member of a typically healthy wolf pack. But just in case, we need to check and to be absolutely sure nothing is spreading. All right, let's see here. There we go. Perfect. What? Uh-oh. 
I didn't even see that bear. Maybe he's heading off. Nope. He's definitely not happy we're here. Hmm. He seems more agitated than outright aggressive. And I'd rather not physically interfere with him if I don't have to. So the best thing we can do right now is slowly back away. Once we're back far enough in the brush, he should lose interest. Okay, I don't see him anymore. Now, let's make this quick. Ooh, we've got a ways to go. Y'all keep an eye out, just in case that bear comes back. Here we are. Oh, beautiful animal. Okay, blood sample taken. Now let's get out of here. Now while we're up here in my home state, I thought we'd take a short break and take a look at the Earth Tours Weapon Locker. When Dino Hunt Corp took over and allowed us access to their weapon builds, we partnered with several of the most prominent firearm manufacturers on Earth to merge the technology and provide a fresh but familiar feel for clients. Since most of the weapons we have down here are customizations or variations on classic Dino Hunt Corp firearm builds, Anyone familiar with the guns on the dinosaur planet should feel right at home down here. Now because hunts down here aren't that frequent, very thorough and detailed and explicitly plotted out, as well as just being fairly emotional affairs, we can't just bring anyone along on the trip. However, once Dino Hunt Corp began overseeing all hunting activity, and we got to use their weapon builds, they helped us develop a virtual reality simulator to test our customizations and make sure the weapons felt more personal to us. Lex Mortensen, our weapons expert, handles the VR rigs and props and knows these weapons like the back of her hand. And she'll be testing them out for us today. So let's pop open the simulations and see how each one handles. The Walter P99 is one of the fastest firing weapons on the tour and is a fantastic self-defense weapon. Developed by German manufacturers and still used by German law enforcement to this day, the P99 is the perfect balance of power and speed. Not overplayed on either side, but features just enough of each to strike that perfect middle ground and let the hunter feel in control. As a handgun, however, it is by no means a primary sporting arm. The short barrel, Lightweight ammo grain and small iron sats will prevent anyone from hitting a fleeing target at 100 meters out. But against a carnivorous ambush, you'd be hard pressed to find a more reliable backup gun. The Benelli R1 is an excellent semi-automatic hunting rifle developed by Benelli, who's based out of Italy. For a point of reference, most clients compare it to the C2 hunting rifle on the second FMM tour. In fact, it's actually a Benelli modified version of that particular rifle, just with the iron sights cleaned up and simplified. It's lightweight, fast, extremely versatile, and is my personal favorite hunting weapon on our tour. Although it's not great for hitting a fleeing target 100 meters out, from bears to boars, you can't get much better than the R1. It's actually a preferred selection among our clientele for hunting warthogs and wild boars, and in areas where invasive, feral pig species run rampant, destroying the native ecosystem, we mount these R1s on helicopters for aerial hunts in an effort to remove as many of the feral hogs from the area as possible. If you're looking for a jack-of-all-trades firearm, look no further than the Benelli R1. The P99 is great because of its quick draw time in an emergency, but if you have the time to actually prepare yourself, self-defense weapons get no better than a good old pump-action shotgun. While perhaps not quite as fast as the P99, the shotgun comes packing much more power. And nothing says back off quite like a spread of 12-gauge shot shells to the face. 
However, because of its intense power and the use of shot shells, it is strictly a backup weapon and not a primary hunting arm. With those shells, you couldn't hit anything too far out anyway, but against a charging predator, there are few firearms that pack the power and ferocity to save your skin quite like this shotgun. The 30-06 pump action rifle is a uniquely built rifle manufactured by Remington. Because of its pump action, it's not near as fast as a Benelli R1, but it hits much harder and is intended to function as an anti-bear gun. In fact, most clients colloquially call it the Grizzly Gun because of just how powerful and effective it is against bear attacks. However, Remington didn't design it with long-range sniping in mind. You've got to get up close and personal for this thing to be of much use, which is why we highly recommend testing it out in the shooting range or in these simulators beforehand since this could be the only thing standing between you and 1,200 pounds of teeth and claws. To differentiate ourselves from Dino Hunt's primary FMM tours, we've renamed their DB, or Double Barreled Shotgun Build, to the SBS, or Side by Side Shotgun. Anyone familiar with the overly romanticized tales of 19th century African big game hunts should recognize this firearm build. And although those were typically rifles, this shotgun performs roughly the same way, capable of firing two massive slugs at almost the exact same time. Again, this ain't a weapon you'd want to use as a primary long-range sporting arm, although there are a crazy few out there who insist on doing so. But in a pinch, this weapon is about as reliable as anyone could ask for. The 300 bolt action rifle is typically what people imagine when they think of big game rifles on a hunting tour. Long range scope, heavy hitting bullet grain, and a bolt action to balance it out. It's all there on the 300. Now this is not a weapon you want when up against a charge and predator. This is your long range, mile out security weapon, preferred by most clients for hunting elk in the mountains of Colorado or warthogs on the grasslands of South Africa. The X-Bow featured on other dino hunt tours is designed specifically for taking down gigantic alien dinosaurs. So when we asked if it would be featured on the Earth tours, the higher ups answered with a resounding no. For the animals down here, not just on account of their size, but our shared history on this planet, our bow selection had to be dialed way back. And we thought, what's more fitting than one of the first projectile weapons man devised to hunt animals? And thus, a simple recurve bow made its way onto the roster. This is the weapon reserved for those who crave the ultimate challenge, the fulfillment of that primal urge to tackle nature without fancy toys or shiny gadgets, but a simple combination of wood string, and stone. There are no sights, no scopes, no semi-automatic firepower, just a mere extension of the human being's internal resourcefulness against the ferocity of the wild. And I believe that covers all the weapons we have to offer on our Earth Division tours. As y'all probably noticed, the simulator creates hunting scenarios with exaggerated animal behavior to see how well each weapon performs under the most extreme circumstances. The thought process being, if it can handle this situation, it can handle anything. Of course, there are other factors to consider. The weapon props are all 3D prints of firearms in perfect condition, so there's always weapon damage, weather damage, user error, and of course, the unpredictability of the natural world to take into consideration but hopefully this gave you a good idea of what we have to offer. All right, now that we've shown off the toys, let's head back down to Africa for our penultimate destination.
Botswana, or the Republic of Botswana, is a country actually located inside South Africa, where we visited earlier. <laughs> yeah, I know, but we've been called back down here for a very sudden and important reason. Plus, it's all green. Botswana itself is roughly the size of Madagascar, and is mostly flat, with 70% of it covered by the Kalahari Desert. A good chunk of our hunting zone is located in the Okavango Delta, one of the most lush areas in all of Africa. Botswana's endured lots of environmental problems over the years, but mostly suffers from drought and desertification. With most of its landscape being covered in desert anyway, the dry season really takes a toll on the environment, and it makes it difficult for non-specialized animals to survive outside the delta areas. Aside from the Okavango Delta and the Kalahari Desert, Botswana features plenty of grasslands and savannas for lots of iconic earth animals. One of those is the white rhinoceros, which we've already observed in other regions of South Africa. But Botswana's big draw is none other than one of the most recognizable African mammals. And if my hunch is correct, which it usually is, there it is, the African elephant, a truly amazing mammal, and I believe there might be another one around here somewhere. There we are, looks like we found ourselves a grazing herd. Even before Dino Hunt Corp arrived, Botswana featured the largest elephant population in the world. And those numbers have only improved since the company's oversight began. As the only surviving member of the Probasidia order, an order which also includes the mighty woolly mammoth, also debuting on a new Dino Hunt tour coming soon, these are among the most recognizable and iconic animals in the world. With their long trunk, also called a proboscis, fearsome tusks, huge ears, powerful legs, and generally impressive size, they can live in all sorts of environments, from grasslands to deserts to forests and swamps. The males, or bulls, usually wander alone or with small groups of other males. But females, also called cows, usually live together in big family groups, with the oldest or most experienced female leading the group as matriarch. Unfortunately, as with many big animals, elephants have faced intense threats over the years, from habitat loss to conflict with the local people, and, of course, illegal poaching for their tusks to sell in the ivory trade. Like our rhino hunts, those wishing to partake in a dino hunt-sponsored elephant hunt help us tag and monitor these Botswanan herds. And since we don't have any elephant hunts booked this week, it's up to us to see how they're doing. We've been receiving reports of a sick young bull in desperate need of medical attention. We can't afford to lose any more elephants, so let's get to what we were called back down here to do and help him before he infects any others or is killed himself. We need to tread carefully. Elephants are right there. A sizable young bull. I believe this is our guy. Ooh, 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 ooh. Nothing quite like it on Earth. Majestic. And yet so tragic. Let's get our samples so our medical team can get to work, and we can get him back on his feet. There we go. Hopefully our efforts here can help these beautiful beasts continue to survive. Looks like that's going to wrap up our trip to Botswana, everyone. And don't worry, we won't be making any more out-of-the-way trips to Africa on this journey. But we have one more stop to make before our time together runs out.
The North Pole is as far north on planet Earth as you can get. The point where the planet's axis of rotation meets the surface. Now unlike the South Pole, which lies on the actual continent of Antarctica, the North Pole lies smack dab in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, surrounded by freezing waters stacked with constantly shifting sea ice. Of course, that doesn't make for very good hunting terrain. So Dino Hunt Corp actually uses the northernmost coasts and surrounding islands of Greenland and Canada to establish hunting zones. The landscape up here seems relatively stable, but it's actually already begun to break apart as the ice continues to melt away. This land is cold and dark. We've actually planned this trip around just how well lit our final location would be so we can get a better look at the environment and the local wildlife. And speaking of, the first one on our list should be around here somewhere. We followed the tracks correctly thus far, so she should be pretty close. There we go, the one and only polar bear. Polar bears usually live out on the shifting sea ice. They are classified as marine mammals after all. But at this time of year, several bears venture farther south toward more stable terrain, usually females looking for dens to raise their cubs. Aside from that particular reason, you'll usually find polar bears out in the sea, hunting down their favorite prey, seals. These are the largest terrestrial predators on Earth and they pretty well have a monopoly on their food sources up here. Aside from the occasional orca, no other large predator really competes with them for food on a regular basis. In exchange for that, uh, I suppose luxury? Their environment is harsh and unpredictable, and food is hard to come by. The rapidly changing climate is forcing these bears into desperate times, and it's our job to make sure their populations are as healthy as can be. Same with other vulnerable or endangered animals on our tours, a dino hunt polar bear hunt is used to track, tag, and research the animals, and that's what we're here to do. It's a rare opportunity to see a polar bear this far inland and this good of light, so let's make the most of it. And there she is, a young female, right across this channel. We should be perfectly safe up here. There we are. Nope, let's see here. Terrain here is slick, so... Watch yourselves coming down. Alright, we are not crossing this channel without a boat, so <laughs> I'll be right back. she is. Absolutely perfect camouflage. And once we're done here, we'll let our research team take over. Beautiful. And now we're looking for perhaps the rarest creature on our trip, but we gotta keep a sharp lookout for them. Their camouflage out here is perfection. Hmm. I can hear one. But I don't. Ah, there we go. Behold everyone, the elusive Arctic Wolf. The Arctic Wolf is actually a subspecies of the Grey Wolf, which we visited earlier in Alaska. These polar wolves are smaller than their cousins to the southwest, and typically are not afraid of humans, even sometimes going so far as to approach humans with curiosity and caution. Beyond that, not much is known about these mysterious animals. 
They often prey on the musk oxen herds that roam farther south from here, but due to the harsh weather and their general elusiveness, we really don't have a good pin on these wonderful creatures. So, like most of the Dino Hunt sponsored hunts in this division, Arctic Wolf hunts help us tag animals to monitor their movements and population. Er, perhaps population in this case. <laughs> uh, moving on. This right here, right now, is one of the only times a year where we even have a chance to see these animals, and we are incredibly lucky to be doing so. While not estimated to be endangered, we just aren't sure how many of them there are, and this one hasn't been tagged yet, so it's a prime candidate for our research program. The trick, however, is actually getting them tagged. Let's see, where? Oh, yeah, that's too far away. At that distance, in this wind, a trank dart will never make it. We gotta get closer. This is the tricky part about Arctic Wolves. They're so darn elusive. Everyone watch yourselves. We're getting close enough for a shot. Let's see. Ah, she's in the brush. Don't want to risk injuring her. Come on. Oh, the rifle's not steady enough. Let me try again. Now, where? Oh, and there she goes. <laughs> what I tell you, as elusive as they come. In a way, you know, I'm fine with this. It is great being a part of this team and helping these animals out keeping up with their population and health, and I firmly believe in the good work we do here. But sometimes, you just gotta let the animals be. Don't interfere, you know? Let nature do its thing. That's a lesson I feel a lot of people could stand to learn. Anyway, we better get on back to base. I believe y'all got a shuttle to a dinosaur planet to catch. All right, and there you go, all. That's the extent of big old Dino Hunt Corp's expansive reach back here on little old Earth. We don't get much attention or recognition down here anymore. I mean, why hunt warthogs when you can hunt dinosaurs, right? But I'm glad the suits upstairs let y'all come down and see how our little side division is still functioning. Funny thing is, I've actually got to head back to the dinosaur planet myself. I was up there for a board meeting last week, took some time off for myself during one of our off days, and ended up saving a baby Triceratops. I've actually been studying Ceratopsians and was even thinking about putting an application to work in that particular division someday. So I was able to take care of the orphan track until our rescue team arrived. Turns out the little thing took a liking to me, and now the baby's caretakers want me back on the planet to help take care of it. Who would have guessed? I'm still thinking about what to call her. Ah, I'm sure something will come to me. Anyway, y'all take care now. Maybe our paths will cross again someday.